You're listening to That Gets My Goat. Dial. Okay. Today, uh, I watched Movie Bob's review of Cars 2, uh-huh. and it started with a dedication. <laughs> it said, Green Lantern Movies, 2011 to 2011. Especially since, A, they didn't even do Sinestro. They saved him for the sequel, which we thought was cool. Might I scream? Now there's not going to li- even likely be a sequel. Well, I guess we're already started, aren't we? Hi, I'm Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. Talking like Barry White today. Thank you. It's for the ladies. Yeah, this it's not even Valentine's Day show. I don't know that the ladies are going to... Sp- it's always Valentine's Day, baby. <laughs> In my bedroom. I don't know if the ladies are going to specifically tune in to the Green Lantern show. It seems like it actually might be anti-lady uh, subject. <laughs> I think all of the, that gets my goats are, are anti-lady. Yeah, that's probably true. And, and anti-men as well. <laughs> like only the guy who edits them listens. Man-child. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. This week we're talking about Green Lantern. We missed Super 8. You didn't see it, right? No, I didn't see it. Did you see it? I think him? you would have been a bit better off, my friend. Yeah, I've heard. Uh, I was I was looking at Rotten Tomatoes today, and Super 8 was like 82. Hmm. Green Lantern was 26, I believe. Well, <laughs> how much credence do you give Rotten Tomatoes? If somebody says, you know, oh, it got really high tometometer score <laughs> do you go oh it must be good well you know i mean they're pretty much usually right you get enough folks that know about movies and pool all their scores together and you're gonna have outliers you're gonna have people that are like oh, i loved it just because it happened to be specifically for that person you know what i mean like sometimes there's a movie like there's that movie phenomenon with john travolta yeah john travolta was in at the time that that movie came out a, I was a big John Travolta fan, which is kind of weird because I don't like him at all now. But at the time, I'd just recently seen Get Shorty, which I absolutely loved that movie, and he was the main character in. And other than that, I really hadn't seen anything of him. And so this was my my measure was Get Shorty. He was super cool, and that movie was awesome. And so any the next movie he was going to come out with, I wanted to see it. So I had John Travolta in it. It was shot just up the hill from where I grew up. So all the scenery in that movie looks exactly like my hometown. It's all, you know, the rolling golden hills with the big oak trees everywhere and stuff. It was shot in Auburn, California. And um, and he butchers Portuguese. He does, yeah. He learns Portuguese in that movie as well, which is a language that uh, I learned in South America. And so, yeah. It was like factors were all lined up for that movie to be especially pleasing for me. So, you know, sometimes you can have that where you have a movie that strangely works for one person where everybody else is just like, eh, it was all right. I don't know. No big deal. Well, I know what you were relating that to. You're talking about Rotten Tomatoes. Right. But uh, Super 8, it tries to evoke late 1970s, early 1980s childhood and also tries to evoke the films of Steven Spielberg from that era. Uh-huh. And it's got a bunch of movie-obsessed kids in it. And now, yeah, is it set in the 70s? It's not set, set in 70. Oh, it is? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, since you haven't seen it, I guess we can't really talk about it. But I know I've gotten old because two or three times in the movie I thought... Oh, doesn't one of these kids have a friggin' cell phone? Just get your cell phone out and everything will be okay. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I recommend that you see that. I, I, I thought it was really good. Well, um, it didn't make a tremendous amount of money its opening weekend, so, you know, RIP. But it held on. So, you know, F the whole opening weekend mentality. Yeah, that's um, good. And plus, it was cheap to make. This is a perfect prologue to our Green Lantern conversation. Right. Uh, I believe, well, they were trying to spin it, saying that Super 8 had a $50 million budget. And so it's already in the green. That was uh, $30 million in actual advertising, and the rest was what they used. <laughs> well, yeah, the advertising thing, the studios aren't really forthcoming with how much they spend on their advertising campaigns. And the theory on Green Lantern was it had a $140 million advertising campaign. So, uh, I can believe that, the amount you seem to see from that. There's that. But, yeah, you and I saw it independent of one another. I believe we'd planned on seeing it together, didn't we? Yeah, we had it all set up, and then you were, had to go out of town and... and uh, oh, and it was your anniversary. I, yeah, I was uh, doing that as well, so it just didn't work. 
And as we said in the uh, the last episode, or leading up to Green Lantern, you know, it could be really, really good, or it could be really bad. I was afraid because the trailer made it look like a cartoon. <laughs> yeah. And I, it was funny in the ensuing weeks before it came out, a lot of people were saying that. Oh, that looks like a cartoon. That's too cartoony. Uh, probably not a complaint that Cars Two is going to get. Anyhow, um, the <laughs> from the reviews that I've read, that's what most people have said. They may say that whether they like it or don't like it, but they always say the animation is, of course, amazing. Well, yeah, I've seen trailers for Cars 2. And, and I, I remember when Cars came out, at the very beginning of that movie, there's this big race, maybe during mm-hmm. the credits or something like that. And they showed that in the trailer, and those things looked like real cars. And I think I saw a clip of that today of Cars 1. And I was like, oh, wow, Cars 2 looks even more real than Cars 1. And then I realized it was Cars 1. (laughs) Back to Green Lantern. So you saw it with your buddy, the one that really loves DC Comics, correct? No. Okay. I saw it with a friend that loves comics in no way particular. Oh, Oh. well, then you have a perfect uh, companion then. To, to, I saw it with somebody who loves DC Comics. As a DC uh, guy all the way, he's always cousin. trying to tell me. My cousin, yeah, he's <laughs> always trying to tell me about how great, uh, greater the DC superhero pantheon he's is. Trying to tell you how great Doctor Light is and how awesome Elongated Man is. Yes, and, yes, often. Yeah, those are really awesome. Though I'm surprised they haven't made a movie of Elongated Man yet. Oh, I'm. Sure, it'll happen, <laughs> judging by how well Green Lantern has done. <laughs> so how gung-ho to, uh, Warner Brothers has always been to begin with. Yeah, you and I uh, saw it with very different people then. And so I think I'll be curious to hear what your friend uh, had to say, because that was a fear that a lot of people had going into it was, is this one going to be too inside baseball? Is it too much for the fans of the comics and everybody else is going to be left out in the cold? And... Uh, It starts with this prologue uh, that Jeffrey Rush reads where he tells you about the history of the Green Lantern Corps and all the members and the history of Parallax and all this stuff. But then when the movie goes, it tells all that stuff again. And I wonder if that prologue was added after, you know, they'd put it all together and said, huh, I wonder if people are going to be lost. Let's let's spill it all out here at the beginning. Yeah, that was one of my uh, complaints, my early complaints is why are you doing the uh, info dump at the start of the show? Why can't you just work this stuff in through the film instead? I don't know. I, I, I tend to get irritated with films that start out with a big prologue. Well, what, what did you think of like the 11, 12 minute Fellowship of the Ring prologue though? Um, there was a, There's a lot to tell in that, although I don't know if it was, I still don't know if it was necessary. But, but, but they were all deceived. deceived. Yeah, there's a lot to tell in that. So depends on how much you have to get across. But the stuff that they told in that stupid Green Lantern uh, prologue was unnecessary, I think. They didn't do anything in particular. The thing is, it was the origin story of Green Lantern. So we have built in already a character who doesn't know anything about this stuff and has to learn it all, just like we have to learn it, us viewers. You know, a lot of times they'll do that kind of crap in a movie where they want to get across some kind of a complicated thing, and so they'll throw in that fish-out-of-water character, the one that doesn't understand what's going on, so that they have to explain everything to that guy. And sometimes that's over the top. But in this case, he had had to learn that stuff anyways. Why can't we just learn it with him? Uh, I, I don't know. Do you want to just immediately start talking about the show, or do you, or, or do you want me to ask you specific things? Uh, well, what did you think of this? And then we can talk about it. Or do you have an agenda? Is there something you want to get off your chest? Like, as there is something I can't <laughs> wait to scream about. I don't have an agenda. I really don't have a lot to say about it. So oh, okay. maybe well, things will come up as like it just did with the prologue when you mentioned that. That reminded me. But uh, yeah, really, as far as it goes, I don't have all that much to say about it. Okay. Well, uh, then let's just start with Ryan Reynolds. What did you think of him as Hal Jordan? I thought he was fine. I thought he was, when it comes down to it, one of the better parts of the show. He's pretty good. I mean, he's a likable guy, and uh, he did a good job. I don't know. I mean, he wasn't given all that much to do, all that much character development, acting, tense scenes of I don't know what. But, you know, he wasn't pushed to the limit or anything of his acting ability. 
So, you know, he did fine uh, as it was. My brother-in-law, who does really love DC, was really sad to uh, have Ryan Reynolds cast as Green Lantern because he wanted Ryan Reynolds to be Flash whenever they get around to doing a Flash movie because... Well, yeah, I, I believe he was either uh, pushing hard to be cast as Wally West or, uh, you know, he was already just set to be Wally West in David Goyer's Flash film, which is not will happen. not happen. Let's just come right out and say Because, yeah, Flash is supposed to be apparently, I mean, I don't really know, but he's supposed to be a wise-ass talk all the time, can't shut up, can't leave well enough alone. And, Ryan and that's Reynolds, Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, really yeah. work. He's done that in a lot of different shows. It's starting to become his thing. But, you know... Neither of them are going to go any further, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm, this is probably better f left for after, you know, in the summing up part where we talk about the aftermath of Green Lantern. But Superman makes $300 million two years from now. Dark Knight makes $400 million a year from now. Maybe they'll start talking again. Mm -hmm. You know, once they've licked their wounds and they're in the black again. Right. So the, uh, I don't know what to bring up next. I mean, there was so much that didn't work on the movie. Maybe I should focus on something that did. Can't think of anything, though, can you? <laughs> okay, well, there, there, there were a lot of complaints about Blake Lively uh -huh. as Carol Ferris. I didn't see the movie opening night, and I don't think you did either. Well, what was opening night? Friday? I imagine it was Friday. Okay, I saw it the next day, so day after. Oh, you did? Night. Okay, On your anniversary? Uh, Bass. We were, <laughs> we were done by then, yeah. I, no, I didn't see it till the following Tuesday, so. The, the, the local theater where I live has a half price Tuesdays oh. kind of thing. I don't know if it's half, but it's, it's cheap on Tuesdays. And so the regular theater, not the dollar theater. Right. I did not know that. And so from now on, if, if I don't see something opening night, but I'd still like to see it that week, I, I think I'll try and hit it on Tuesday. That's a good idea. We may have to change our normal get together night to Tuesday night and then just go see a movie and then come back. <laughs> so I had already heard terrible things. Right. About unspeakable horrors. I had. I, I mean, I remember just when that first trailer came out and she says, you have the ability to overcome fear. Somebody on the internet said, really? That's a take you're going to go with? Okay. <laughs> and, that, and I was just like, oh, so, so she's really bad, huh? And also let me, me start with, I, I don't like Blake Lively oh, yeah. at all. Uh, at, at the Green Lantern panel last year, everybody was just so head over heels in love with hmm. those bosoms. Uh, and I just, I was like, I, I'm sorry, you guys, I don't like her. I, you're free to, you are welcome to date her, sir. But I don't, I don't like her. And so I was really looking for it on Tuesday. Uh, okay, I'm going to, because I already don't like her. Mm -hmm. Anytime she stumbles over a line or gives me some blank look Megan Fox kind of thing, <laughs> I'm going to be all over her like... Like a CG costume would be. Ooh, not like it's, the fanboys at the panel? You're going to be all over like that? No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, in, a, in a very negative way. Like a CG costume. Oh, okay. And uh, it's so weird. I I didn't see it. I, I was looking for it. I wanted to hate her, and I didn't. So I don't know. Maybe that means that she wasn't so bad. Maybe that means I'm just blind. I, I, I don't know. Maybe the bosoms uh, finally got to you. I, I I didn't. I didn't dislike any. It did seem like she didn't have very many good lines. Stuff that was written to make her fun, uh, likable, anything. She tended. She was like the Uncle Ben character. It seemed just always like you can be better than you are. You're so lame, and I'm great. The whole time is like basically what every line was that she had to say, which is makes her aside from the fact that she's way hot. That keeps you from totally hating her, and it's a good thing because uh, she, they didn't give her a lot of good lines to make you like her. And because she was way hot, it seemed awful wrong for her to be the hotshot pilot plus CEO of a company that saves the government contract and etc. I don't know. It made it a, a little Sorry, unbelievable. I, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Where did that government contract storyline go? I think it was just taken care of. It was going to be lost. Well, didn't you then... think those damn drone things were going to come after him at the end? It was like an Iron Man kind of setup where it's like, okay, uh -huh. we're going to show you what these things can do so that when they turn against you at the end of the movie, it'll be like, oh, we already know what these things can do. 
but they never even showed up again. No, yeah, they were they were just a, a throwaway action sequence for for the beginning of the film, like The Rock when what's his face? What's the uh, Nicholas? Who? Where? How? When Nicholas Cage goes to disarm whatever it was, and like the stuff sprays out, and it's like, <gasps> and then it just ends, and he stops it or whatever, and. It's not really important because The Rock is going to get taken over and he's going to have to take care of that. And it's just a expository action scene to show you that Hal Jordan is awesome and reckless. Okay. Uh, now, I don't know how well you know Hal Jordan. I don't really. To tell oh, you the okay. Truth. I don't either. I was going to ask you how was this Hal Jordan? Was this was this true to the character? Was it, you know? But but yeah, never mind. We'll know move on. If he's supposed to be kind of a douchebag or not? Seems like that's what they wanted you to think of him, though. I guess he was supposed to progress and be less of a douchebag by the end. They were trying to give him an arc, a, yeah. a Tony Stark kind of thing. Right. That's uh, some uh, a review that I read of the film actually referenced that, saying that. Uh, what was the other movie that they compared it to? Well, Another superhero movie? I read a review where they said that uh, there was this movie with Tom Cruise where he was a pilot and that he had lost his father and then he had a flashback of his father's death during like a maneuver or something like that. And having never seen that Tom Cruise movie, I'll just have to take their word for it. Hmm. That wasn't what they were comparing it to. No, no, it was a superhero movie. They were just saying he had this, the same arc as X... And it was about as interesting because it was a fairly crappy superhero movie. And then they said it ends also kind of similar to Tony Stark, which was done much better in Iron Man when uh, it had its run. But yeah, it was very Tony Stark-like. Well, the, that trailer, and I, I believe the movie starts with him with the ridiculously hot blonde and he ditches her out and right. goes running and leaves her in the bed by herself. And I, I'm sure, I'd bet your life on it, that Tony Stark did that exact same thing in Iron Man 1. That he bedded some ridiculously <laughs> hot blonde and then he ditched her out. And, and then she turned out to be like a reporter later on, ambushed him at the uh, gala. Is that how you say that word? Gala or gala? Uh, I believe due to political correctness, it is now gala. Oh. So, uh, All right, so uh, hold on. We, we've been talking for a while. I don't know. The get My goats are supposed to be short. So we'll cut ourselves off here, and then we'll pick up from here next week. So uh, folks, I'm sure, are getting used to us doing this by now. So here we are. I, th that's, I think it works that way. Yeah, that's been our show for today. Tune in next week. On a very special episode <laughs> of That Gets My Goat. That's right. See you later, folks. Good night. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license for some reason. The actor who's doing the voice of Smog in The Hobbit. Mm-hmm. Benedict Cumberbatch. Wow. Jeff just loves that name, but I think it's maybe the worst name ever. Benedict Cumberbatch. If, if your name's Cumberbatch to begin with, <laughs> you really ought to just be named Joe or something. The parents were not kind. It, their other kids was like Constantine, probably, and like uh, Algernon. <laughs> oh, hey, that's good. Cumberbatch. <laughs> Algernon Cumberbatch and his brother Benedict. <laughs>